complicated, you know, man. It's like a damn Rubik's cube, man. You like talking about a blue bread, man. Then you get to one side, then like man. All right, Dave, the distributist. Welcome to the Jay Burden Show. How are you doing? Hello. Uh, just unmuted there. How's it going? Uh, I'm doing well, and I'm and I'm really grateful to have you on. No, no, I've been a huge fan of your show since I discovered it a few months ago, so it's great. I think you're one of the up-and-coming interview shows or interview podcasts. You're kind of uh, right behind the Alex Kashuda thing the, that she's been doing for a few years now. But no, I'm really glad to be on, uh, and I think we're going to have an interesting conversation. So, Especially yeah, since, since I think the, reason, the reason why I'm kind of drawn to your channel and your perspectives is that you you kind of come from the other half of America that I do, but I think we see things in a very similar way. And so there probably are some interesting contrasts there. Right. And, and I and I should say, I realize it's always uncomfortable to kind of enter the situation where, you know, you're you're both familiar with the other person's work, but not necessarily personally familiar with the other person. Because you actually were, you know, a very influential figure on me intellectually because I kind of described before of this kind of uncomfortable, uh, I guess, kind of like two-sided approach to politics. Which on one hand, mm -hmm. there was this kind of my brain, that, you know, being exposed to figures like Moldbug and kind of like the the anti-liberal tradition at a you know pretty early age from my friend Bagby, but also having just kind of like this like, instinctual like revulsion to a like the the essentially the materialist atheist streak of a lot of you know neo reactionaries, and so it was really helpful. You provided kind of a bridge between those two points, and and specifically actually a video that I've gone back to just dozens and dozens of times was your video specifically on horror and why you know horror is kind of a reactionary topic, wow. uh, so much so that uh, weirdly enough, my uh, my fiance who's not particularly political at all but is an artist. <laughs> found your your part about Bosch kind of particularly interesting. So that, that's a, a classic. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> I always like hearing what people like. You know, I really wish I could make more long form videos, but it's just, it's a it's a weird time on YouTube. The algorithm punishes it almost. And uh, you know, I don't have the time I did I used to to make those kind of videos. Although, you know, I still write essays. So, you know, that's that that is what it is. Right. And, and so to go back to what you said about you and I kind of being from two sides of America, you have this concept and I've kind of adopted it, right? Of, of red and blue America. And while I think it's, you know, kind of self-explanatory just for people who aren't clued in, could you kind of define your terms there? Well, I mean, it's, it's basically the culture war divide that we've had in this country for 60 years, but largely the division. And I would consider it kind of a caste division is between the, the, the rural, rural areas and the suburban areas, which are populated by, you know, conservatives, people who are loyal to the original American project. And then you've got urban areas, which are utterly dominated by the new American elite, the new American elite since 19, well, basically since the 1930s, what we might call the Brahmin caste of America. And uh, their, their values have been diverging for 60 years now. And they're both, they're both kind of at these impasses culturally. I, I said this several times before, that the, the problem we're dealing with is that everyone everyone can see that the right can't win and the left is full of shit. And people in blue America can see that the left is full of shit. It's, it's not a secret anymore. And no one can really come up with a solution. There's an impasse here because all of the energy and all of the power is on the side that can't do anything but kind of keep the ship moving in the direction that it's been moving in for the last 60 or 70 years. And this creates kind of a cultural division. It, it also creates a cultural division on the right where, you know, Aaron McIntyre had this video out today called the, the neocon cycle. You know, the neocons were very famously this group of ex Trotskyist intellectuals that came out of NYU in the sixties and then joined the Reagan coalition in the eighties when they got disillusioned with the Trotskyist project. And they more or less took over the Republican Party for 20 years. And Aaron, Aaron's point is, well, you know, this is how the cycle works is the left left me. All of a sudden, elites come over to the right wing side and they're immediately made its leaders. But they end up making the exact same mistakes as they did previously. 
And so the cycle continues and the left just kind of moves forward iteratively and never suffers any consequences. The sort of counterpoint to that is that it seems, and this has been very solidified in my mind in the last four months, that that sort of the red America that that you see in the conservative movement is just totally out to lunch with what the culture of this country actually looks like and what the problems that face it really are. And they might have their heart in the right place, but their mind certainly isn't. And it leads to these kind of, you know, really kind of embarrassing uh, fiascos that have occurred in the last three months. I, I know your New Year's resolution is to not talk about Rod Dreher, but you know all sorts of stuff like that, right? I will say that 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 New Year's resolution lasted approximately four days, so I think <laughs> at this point it's probably a lost battle. Look, look in, in six months we probably will never talk about him again. But you know he, it, it, that that circumstance was so interesting because it underlined everything wrong with the right wing conception of the battle they fight what the what the battle is that they're fighting and not everything wrong but but a major thing that was wrong and you encounter these things all the time at, at the risk of rambling you know i have i have a lot of nationalist friends I'm not nationalist myself and they always kind of slide into this mode where they do things like white lives matter and stuff like that you can see this in 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 groups like the Patriotic Alternative, where, where they try to, or, or they try to put up posters against anti-whiteism or something like that. The, the problem is, is that what they're doing is they're copying the left, and they're not even copying leftists themselves. What they're doing is they're copying leftist client groups. But when leftist client groups like the African American community go out and in protest like this, they're making a request to somebody who can actually pay them. These requests are kind of like going into the ether. It's literally like a cargo cult. There, there's nobody here to deliver on on this performance you're putting on. Uh, you're you're putting up these flyers and copying these slogans, and your, your grievances, I think, in many ways, have a lot of validity to them, but but they're not going to have the same effect at all. Well, and it brings up kind of one of the core mistakes of red state Americans. And I should say going into this, and this should be obvious, that the reason I spend so much time critiquing these people is not that I dislike them, far mm -hmm. from that. It's that these people are being handed cards by their enemies. They're being handing a losing yeah. deck over and over and over again. And understandably, you're getting frustrated. Like, why do we always lose? And the answer is essentially you're you're playing the role your opponent wants you to play. Yes. And one of the, the core ways you could describe that is that a, a lot of, you know, red staters kind of fall into the same illusion that duelists do, you know, and C.S. Lewis uh, has a, has a section about this where he essentially talks about dualism as a philosophy and why it's not correct. Yeah. And, and in a moral sense, he says, well, well, good and evil are not the same. You know, one is a corruption of the other, but in, in this case, we're not seeing a, a fight between two equal parties. Right, we're essentially seeing a fight, a fight between the inner and outer party, you know, with a few, you know, kind of like scattered malcontents on the outside, mm -hmm. and creating this situation in your head where you are just as important, where you are just as, and I don't mean I don't think these people are important. I mean to the people in power, you are just as important as a client group is. You're deluding yourself, and you're setting yourself up over and over and over again to be just completely like have your legs kicked out from under you. Yeah. And this is, it's, it's very frustrating to see this. I suppose I, I kind of see it from the opposite perspective where I, I just want the society that produced me to take a giant L because I think that it's totally corrupt and I don't think anything can get fixed in it until it kind of gets wiped out or just reset fundamentally. And, and for that reason, I sympathize with this red American world, but, you know, I, I'm just not of it. And I I don't know. I, I It's hard to see exactly where this goes because, um, you know, now that the Trump phenomenon is over, you get the sense no one really understands what's going to come next. Obviously, it seems like the Biden administration is going absolutely nowhere. The, the only thing that seems like it could happen is that there would be some kind of alternative uh you know, alternative dissident force, but that's 
are very hard to get off the ground as we we're, we're understanding right now. Right. Well, well, right. And I think that to me at this point, the, the, the final test of what do we, not even Trump, but kind of like the MAGA movement, the MAGA strategy was, you know, the, the elections, right. Was the, the elections we recently went through the midterms. Yeah. Because I don't, I didn't think this was likely, you know, but there was a, there's a mathematical possibility that the, the strategy you know, by the people in charge would have essentially have been to, well, we'll let the Republicans have this one and nothing will change. And that didn't happen. You know, either the, the, the Republicans, which is, you know, that the token rooster was so incompetent that they, they couldn't even handle that. Or, you know, the people in charge were essentially so ideologically captured that they couldn't even let that slip a little bit, you know, even a, even just a, a victory of, you know, kind of like a symbolic victory. And so to me, I, I kind of share your feeling where it's like, I'm not, I, I don't really see a solution without a major change of material circumstance, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean that everything goes to Mad Max, you know, that, that we become, you know, a, a Somalia with 330 million people. But to me, it's <laughs> like, I, I think that the the order of the day and the order of the Biden regime is, is kind of managed decline. Like that seems to be kind of like the path going forward. Yeah, it's it's. Man, I thought I, I remember one knew it would be managed decline, but this is something. This is not well managed decline. The they, the the administration seems to be ruled by either the well, it seems to be a tug of war between the intelligence agencies and then a group of hysterical millennials that get Biden to do weird shit occasionally. That right to make course, themselves feel better. That makes yeah, absolutely no sense better. in a broader context. It makes absolutely no sense, and so it just it. This is this the shittiest managed decline of all time. It makes uh, you know it makes Commodus and Diocletian look like just masters of management. And I I don't I I don't know. It's it's it. I I wasn't expecting this. I was expecting some kind of Thermidorian kind of put the woke away attitude from Biden. And, and I think that's what, you know, this is that that's the winning move for the Democrats at this stage is to put the woke away. They put the woke away. They got ten, they got 10 more years. But if they keep on going down this route where their incompetence metastasizes while they fray their coalition, they'll maintain power because of how they structured the election. The elections have fundamentally changed in this country from elections being about ballot casters to elections being about ballot harvesters. But ju just the way they're managing this and their inability to control their own people is going to just, I think it's going to capsize their coalition at some stage, but we'll, we'll see right. how long. And, and again, lasts. if we were in a situation where we did have two, you know, equal and opposite, you know, political forces that, well, that would be it. That would be an opportunity and you, know, you could mm -hmm. capitalize on that. But the problem is like the leader of these, you know, these red state coalitions are, they're not, they're, they're kind of like the car or the dog chasing the car, right? They have yeah. no expectation they have no plan to do or to, you know, with what to do when they actually get there, you know, they're, they're, they're essentially just a, you know, copium dealers. You know, well, I mean, they, 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 they know what they're going to do. They, they want to get into office and then give a bunch of feel good speeches and employ some of their friends, but by no means restructure the bureaucracy. And then they want to have a library named after them and kind of retire and wave their hands about the state of things. That's the that's been the Republican plan since the end of World War II. Right. Yes. Which in essentially is essentially nothing. Right. Yeah. It's not what. And I think that's really why at this point. And I think there are kind of two events, which I consider kind of like the true death knells of, of populism, you know, which is one, and this is more symbolic than actual, which is, you know, the, the populist delusion, that book coming out, you know, kind yeah. of like a, a firm refutation with, to which I, I've never really heard a good argument against it. You know, you can dislike AA all you want, you know, I can, I, I can, I really <laughs> I, like, I, like it, you know, <laughs> I, I do too, but it's one of those people where it's like, he makes it easy to dislike, right? Yeah, Especially I mean, he's, if a you're grumpy, he's a grumpy not young, not old man. Right, exactly. But nonetheless, right, there was no there was no coherent argument against those points. But also when we've seen with, you know, kind of like the Brazilian debacle is essentially, as far as I'm aware, every populist has been removed. And it seems like they've accomplished essentially nothing. And again, I don't say that out of some sort of vindictiveness. You know, I wish that would have worked. 
But to me at this point, it does kind of seem like populism is a, it's just dead and buried. Yeah. Well, these countries still have to r rule. And in, in the case of Brazil, it's hard to see how they rule. Well, I mean, I guess it is easy to see how they rule. They just, they're the only government that can possibly be, but it, it, it does feel, it feels like the majority stakeholders everywhere in Brazil are just not on board with Lula. seems like the only person on board with Lula is the state department and all the people that they, they paid to, you know, mark the ba ballot L and that that's pretty much it. There seems to be no sort of organic political force behind this guy. Well, and that's actually something I, I've kind of been interested to see more broadly, right? It, it's kind of like the collapse of, you know, the, the popular mandate, right? The mandate of heaven. Because to me, it, even in, because I, I do have, you know, friends and family in kind of blue state areas, very, very few people seem to be actively supporting the regime you know it, it's at best kind of a grudging well at least it's not orange hitler type of state mm. and so i wonder like how long like what will be the play you know to regain popularity because to a certain point right we obviously know that it's not really a 50 plus one percent you know this magical number of consensus but regimes do require some amount of public support and i, I guess i don't understand maybe it's just you know, endless, you know, fracturing into different, you know, special interest groups, you know, just eternal bio-Leninism, you know, just creating client groups. Maybe that's the play. The play is to, the, the play is to make, obviously, so, so like we can kind of go through it here. The boomers are basically out. They just need to keep them quiet. Most boomers, even most Democrat boomers know something is wrong, but they're too old and tired to do anything about it. Let's be fair. You know, they're in their 70s. That is what it is. Then you have the, you know, coming coming up after them, you've got sort of the Xers, which are the silent generation of our time. And then millennials, and, and the, the route with millennials that the left imagines is to turn them all into client groups or, or to give them sort of political ambitions that are just totally removed from reality, su such that their demands upon entering any kind of distant group are going to be, first of all, they're going to prioritize things that are antithetical to any healthy human social organization. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, I mean, imagine trying to incorporate the, the modern, like imagine just for shits and giggles that, you know, the, the left and the right were trying to work together into an organized political coalition against the mainstream neoliberal establishment it would be it would be nuts because the requests coming from the left would be to essentially suspend reality and disestablish the moral regulations you need to survive as a religion or an ethnic group and that's our conditions for being you know part of your coalition it's kind of funny but the 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 advent of intersectionality has essentially given an entire generation the 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 most it, it's almost like a it's a wet dream for tyrants cuz they they made everyone emphasize the elements of their personality that are just the most psycho <laughs> and the most, um, you, you know, the most antithetical to actually living independent middle class lives or fighting for your own interests. Well, and the question to me is that the way that the left has, has acquired power, right, is essentially like it's social fission, right? It is using entropy mm -hmm. to produce energy, right? We will break down political bonds. You know Carlyle's, you know, divorce from all, divorce of all from all, and use that to translate it into political power. And the question is, can they keep doing this, or will they create so much entropy? Will they break down so many bonds that, you know, kind of the 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 money engine at the heart of all of this stops working? And I think that's kind of the open question. Like, is this something that they can, you know, keep? they can keep this system working at a lower and lower efficiency rate, or does it kind of come to a, come to a rest very quickly or abruptly? Uh, but this is the problem. I mean, it looks, the, the, mo the money engine looks like it's not working so well anymore, but who knows what that means? Uh, we all, all we know is that it's working less well than it used to, but all, all that means is that we are in the decline phase. We don't have any idea how long the decline phase is going to last. 
uh, j just that the, the returns for increasing the complexity and, and the chaos are going to slowly start, uh, you know, disappearing. Obviously, the ruling class believes that it can just overcome all of this with AI. That's their sort of last hope, I suppose. Well, it's interesting because I know you've been been reading the, the three body problem. And and I just had a conversation last night. I haven't finished it. <laughs> ah, oh, so yeah, yeah I have. I haven't book. finished. I, I didn't. Your last interview was the one one on your channel. I think that I haven't watched because I haven't fin finished reading that book. I'm almost done, but yeah, it's very uh, good. Don't watch it. But okay. there there is an interesting, and I won't. I will reveal nothing. In the first half of the book, the we're good. <laughs> right. We're, we're essentially there's there's a there's a problem that cannot be solved by the traditional elite and there's a character whose answer is oh i know i'll solve the problem with ai you yeah. know and it's essentially this idea of like well we can't solve it so we'll make a computer that will just fix it for us mm -hmm. and i think that you see this this kind of like this problem with the relationship we've had towards technology right where you know according to kind of this like progressive, I guess, like Whig version of history, you know, things are always getting better. And so the logic runs, well, if there's a problem now we cannot solve, if we just wait long enough, you know, a, a silver bullet will fall into our lap. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that AI is kind of that, that prophesied magic bullet that, oh, we don't have to think of a solution because the natural force of history, you know, this, this kind of like grand trend over time will just do it for us. And to me, I think it's interesting because I, I'm not, I'm not a technical expert, but I, I'm not necessarily convinced about generalized AI. You know, to me, it seems like all of the interactions I've personally had with AI, which is basically in, in school as like a finance application, is mm -hmm. basically an incredibly sophisticated algorithm, which don't yeah, get it's me a wrong, it's a powerful tool. Yes, exactly. But it's not, my society is broken, fix it. it, it that, yeah. That's a huge jump. No, I mean, this is, this is, I, I talked about this a little bit in my most recent video essay slash Substack article, but. There's a lot of reasons to be skeptical of general AI, not to mention the fact that that they're also hobbling their AI's epistemological um, effectiveness because they're they're catechizing it with their own ideology, and, and that's going to become prohibitive as their ideology grows. Well, right, exactly. It's like you know when 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 your ideology only only touches maybe you know one or two relevant factors then that's kind of a variable you can control for but when when this kind of like new state religion becomes more and more jealous and more and more all encompassing it's kind of like well when when you when you've essentially locked all but a few variables like why are you surprised when you can only come up with one or two you know not particularly accurate models of what's going on yeah, and and you know I, I see Charlemagne in the chat saying something similar, but the the it's it's hard to say. I mean, you know, you you joke that you're obsessed with Rod Dreher, but but my sort of obsession this year has been SBF Sam Bankman Freed, which is just he's just the icon of how the mainstream thinks they're going to get out of this mess by creating sort of these new entrepreneurs. But the problem is, is that Sam Bankman Freed's success is totally manufactured or artificially by his own privilege so so he, he earns money and gives it back to them but all the money he earns is basically 100 percent a bubble <laughs> based on his own you know his own prestige and his own ability to sell himself as a genius for doing kind of ordinary things and so at the end of the day, all, all they're doing is just an elaborate way to kind of steal more money out of the system and create more chaos. And of course, these things always explode. Well, and, and there's an interesting you know, thought I've kind of been been playing with. And, and, and the boomers are, are kind of like one of the big boogeymen in our spheres. And part of it's justified, part of it's not. But there's something interesting, and this has been widely remarked upon, that the, the boomers have, especially liberal boomers, have theoretically progressive values, but functionally fairly conservative ones. 
Yeah. And so in every one of these institutions, because the boomers have never relinquished power, essentially, <laughs> until mm. they've only done it when they've died, right? That a lot of the chaos of the boomers kind of stated preferences has really only manifested behind them, you know? And while they were still at the helm, I mean, things were not good, but there was kind of a hard cap on how badly they could go because essentially mm. every, everyone running those was, you know, and, and kind of like the interior level actually relatively competent, you know, compared yeah. to kind of these, like it, these, these like horrible spiteful mutants that boomers have kind of created, you know, with the ideology that they wanted to promote. And so I think that we're, we're kind of seeing is all at once, not really all at once, but kind of in the, in the post Obama era that, the, the the children of the boomers, both ideologically and literally, have finally started to claw their way into power and it's creating just horrible disasters, you know, yeah. and we were kind of insulated by that, by the selfishness of that same generation. Yeah, you could see there was, um, what's what's her face? There is, uh, there is this, do you remember that, uh, is it Allie Richards or whatever? I, I, she, she was this woman who did this absolutely inane uh, I'm looking up her name now. This absolutely inane conspiracy theory graph. Yeah, it was um, it was Abby Richards. Uh, yeah, she, she was this TikTok star, and she did this insane conspiracy graph that had no axes, and it, it was just it was just the only thing it demonstrated. It ran conspiracies basically by how much she didn't like them. But the only thing it demonstrated was her complete inability to think systematically and make a graph or to understand reality outside of her ideology. And it not only she, so she made a bunch, a, a graph, a meme and a bunch of inane TikTok videos. She immediately gets hired by a think tank. And then recently she got hired by Rand, which is like Rand for people who are not aware is sort of the primary United States strategic think tank since the end of world war two. Like this is a big deal. This is where all the, the big, brained gray matter people stand and determine how America is going to rule the world and publish the policy briefs that are read by the state Dep department and the department of the De and the department of defense. And now it's being staffed by like this brain dig TikToker who can't even label the axis on a graph. <laughs> it's, it's, it's nuts. Well, and I saw this in, in university, right. Mm -hmm. That I, I kind of witnessed a relatively high ranking, you know, finance program. I witnessed the changing of the guard, you know, kind of midway through where these, these baby boomers who were libs, you know, they were liberals, they were blue stater types, mm. you know, handed over their seats, you know, retired to millennials. And while new rankings haven't been published, there is no way on earth the school will be able to maintain standards just based on what I saw, because yeah. essentially these people who, you know, mouthed the, this kind of like initial generation of baby boomers mouthed all the progressive platitudes still held their students to what would be considered. And I don't like this term, but it's, you know, the term you hear to quote unquote white standards, right? Mm. There was, there was no time for the kind of like, you know, uh, well, I'm late because of my, you know, racial status or my gender <laughs> because status. Because of oppression, that. right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. They, they would, they didn't understand it and they wouldn't stand for it, but the new programs head would. And yeah. almost immediately, and I say this as someone who took advantage of it, standards dropped dramatically because, you know, the, 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 the millennial, the, actually, I believe she was a Gen Xer, but my point stands, right? This kind of like hyper credentialed, you know, woman in her, you know, in her early forties was just non-functional, right? Because mm -hmm. she had been raised in the ideological, I guess, like milieu of academia post baby boom. Yeah. And now you get taken seriously. Whenever I think of this, the 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 mode that you're describing, I think of one movie director who had this like period in the late 2000s, early 2010s, where he was really popular. Judd Apatow. Do you know that? Like, do you, do you remember those movies? You know, like uh, yeah, yeah, Super Bad and and yeah, I, I, and the 40 year old virgin and forgetting Sarah Marshall. And, and these these movies, there was sort of a a and knocked up there's sort of a judd apatow formula which is that it would depict something that was just like absolutely degenerate and then it would convince you somehow that 
the characters would sort of arrive at this state of wholesomeness that they had no right to based on their actions. Their actions would do all of the wrong things that would just, you know, leave their lives in complete shambles. But yet somehow they arrive at wholesomeness at the end. And it's like, well, all's well that ends well, you know, good old fashioned American wholesomeness reasserts itself after all. And life goes on. It's just, I remember watching these things as sort of a young progressive and going, this is just all bullshit. This is all cope. These people in real life would never end up in these situations. And, uh, and, and I think that's kind of the, the world of the baby boomers and, and the, in the older Gen Xers, I think Apatow himself is an older Gen Xer. They live in a world where gravity kind of takes you back to normalcy, but, but we're way out of the orbit of normalcy at this stage. <laughs> And and flying well, off into the void. Yeah. It, because there was kind of this process, again, by which the baby boomers were, they were a, a digression from what was normal. And and I think it's it's a fair point made that the silent generation is owed just as much of the blame here. And, and that's a discussion for another time. Yeah, policy-wise, certainly. Yes, yeah. And just like their unwillingness to actually stand up for themselves. But to, to be fair, right, the, the baby boomers went wildly outside of you know what their parents considered normal mm. and when they kind of quote unquote returned to center they returned let's just say 80 percent of the way there in practice yeah the problem was that 20 percent didn't necessarily matter for them but it dramatically mattered for their children yeah and so essentially for many baby boomers and i can count my grandparents among this they were able to act out and everything was fine you know, there's this massive store of capital, both, you know, socially and both materially that was able to kind of bail them out, you know? And so you were able to, you know, sow your wild oats. You were able to, you know, maybe smoke a little bit of weed. You know, you were able to do all the things that, you know, were considered rebellious at the time. But the problem is for their children, you know, for their grandchildren, right? They, it progressively degenerated more and more. And, and I, well, I'm not really into a lot of the discussion about degeneracy because it can kind of in a weird perverse way almost become masturbatory. Yeah. But, but I think there is something to be said for the fact that like, well, okay. Like I, I'm not one to go around and be kind of like the police of vice and virtue, but I can tell you for a fact, things are not working. And, and interestingly enough, one of the ways that I've seen this and kind of seen this over a time jump, right. Is that, you know, just kind of by virtue of being, you know, in an extremely conservative religious community in a red state area, I was largely sheltered from this. You know, it was something that I didn't really experience towards college. But my dad was kind of a, you know, a, a stereotypical, you know, Gen X wild child, right? Went out, did all the things, traveled the world. And, you know, he and my mother eventually ended up getting a divorce. And so now he's, you know, in his, his late 40s and he's started dating again. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to him is that he never really changed personally his sexual mores from a time in the mid nineties when he was considered, you know, kind of like on the, the normal for a young man, right. Which was generally, mm -hmm. you know, you have sex like serial monogamy, right? Like you have, yeah. you have sex with someone you've been dating for a while. And now my dad, who, according to him has never really gone through much of a change. You know, he, he kind of kept his, his own common sense is on the other end of, you know, 30 years. And it's basically like, well, what the heck? Like, where, where did all the rules go and yeah. can't find anyone to, to, you know, spend time with because the, the, the social mores have changed to such a degree that it essentially, it, it, it makes it incredibly difficult to form a relationship. And my point in this is not just like, Oh, woe is us. You know, like we, this is, you know, just endless degeneracy because again, that's not particularly productive, but it is to say that like the baby boomers, talked much more about liberation than they ever actually practiced it. And we're kind of really getting the fruits of their revolution now. Sure. But this is actually where we come back to our original topic, because the real car culprit here is the university system, because the period of time that, that dictated this change, I believe was the nineties kind of baby more stopped going left in the seventies by and large. And in the 80s and 90s, they kind of took stock of their lives and tried to figure out what was right or wrong about the 60s. And this has also happened to occur during the deindustrialization of America. And so the story that boomers told themselves 
really precipitously. It, it was basically a story of why are some people losers and why are some people winners? And the the thing is, is that the people who had kind of joined the '60s, and you see these people in, you know, I I, I don't come from Berkeley, as I always say, but but I, I'm very kind of connected to it culturally through friends and the fact that I was there all the time. You see this in Berkeley where you have people who are just utter burnouts from the 60s and they occupy kind of ridiculously prestigious roles inside the city's culture and sometimes even in the university. And uh, they're kind of a, a weird patrician class. They're, they're oddly high status. And uh, the story the boomers came up with was that the – the, the most important thing was to go to college and to join this sort of uh, intellectual class. And it, it didn't, because the people who failed, they, they either just failed out of drugs or they failed because they joined the working class and their art was deindustrialized and they didn't go to college. So the, so the lesson they, they took from that was, well, as long as you go to college and join this patrician class, you can be as big of a fuck up as you want to and and still like this magical force of education and liberation in the 60s it'll just be there for you because the force of progress will pull you through and and now we're saying sort of the the ultimate kind of collapse of this where you have people that they, they played into this academic prestige game and they lived horribly degenerate lives and now their lives are just a mess and the money that the boomers just thought would be there never materialized. Well, right. And again, it was in addition, and I think this is kind of just a, a broad theme is that we're, we seem to kind of being, especially in the post 2020 world, the bill has come due for a variety of choices that, that had short term benefits and long term costs. Mm. And, and interesting, you bringing up deindustrialization is a, is a really good example of that. You know, because in kind of a reverse image, you know, you've said before that, you know, kind of the 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 red state, the red staters are on a 15 to 20 year uh, like cultural gap from the blue states. But I almost feel like blue states are on, you know, a 15 to 20 year gap on on red state economics in the yeah. sense that, you know, where I'm from. Right. It was, a, it was a big furniture producing area, you know, so much so that, you know, the, the fairly famous, you know, lane chests, right, which were these, you know, cedar chests sold all over the world were made, you know, relatively close to where I live. But all of that got, you know, eaten away as, as has been described many times, you know, during the 80s and the 90s, again, by, you know, essentially, you know, baby boomers graduated from Harvard Business School. Yeah. And in a way that that the kind of like two forms of, you know, metastasizing cancer, you know, from both ends, right? The cultural and the economic ha have finally, you know, caught up with each other and <laughs> really over the whole country. And, and I think that obviously there have been some, what seems to me largely feeble attempts to re-onshore certain industries, right? With the CHIPS Act and things like that. But but to me, the the thing that you said about, you know, kind of like the dual headed nature of, you know, the current government, you know, on one hand, we have you know, the neocons who really only care about the economy so long as it can fund, you know, the military industrial complex. And on the other end, you have, you know, childless millennial women who basically only seem to care about making chuds mad. And to yeah. me, at least, like, I don't see where a solution comes from. Well, it always reminded me of this conversation I had with my parents uh, about 10 years ago, where, you know, this is before I started my blogging career, but I was kind of on the conservative side of things. And it was very obvious that this college thing wasn't working out for a lot of people. And their, their solution was, well, it's millennials. They just don't want young men. They just look down on being something like a plumber or a mechanic or, or some blue collared worker. And those guys make good money. Like, why don't they do that? And, you know, I, I kind of exasperatedly said it's, it's because there's, there's, you, you look down on young men who pursue blue collared work in their 20s. And not only that, that's actually not the worst part of it. The worst part of it is that, you know, our class for the last 20 years has been teaching all young women essentially going to college and getting into like tens of thousands of dollars in debt to get studies degrees and basically, uh, you know, useless degrees. 
telling them that they are massively superior to blue collar men and teaching them to despise them. Uh, if you take this route as a young man and you live in a blue area, I mean, you might, you better have something else going for you. That's huge. That gives you some kind of confidence because you're going to be socially looked down on and, and no one wants to take that hit. And, and that's kind of the world that we set up. And, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess it's just going to have to come to that where, where people are going to have to determine their worth in sort of an underclass position. But everything about how we established status and who's worth listening to and who's not worth listening to is, is completely perverse in the, in the present era. And it, it all functions around a credentialing system that in many ways uneducates people on how to make wise decisions and convinces sort of, and I, I said this earlier in this year, the, the drama kid supremacy rule by drama kids. I mean, if you went in high school, everyone always talks about the jocks being stupid. The jocks were actually some of the smartest, most level-headed leaders imaginable. The people who you really didn't want to be in charge were the drama kids uh, because they were basically narcissists that would create chaos and, and thrive off of it. But our modern university system has taken the people who are, are the, they're, they're fine people otherwise, but they're, they're the least able to handle power responsibly. And it's convinced them that they deserve it and they need to wield it. And they need to wield it against the the, the people uh, who who actually have uh, you know skin in the game and, and 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 lives to lead. And this is where you get, like you said, the the 40-year-old millennial who she's she's I mean, she should be desperately looking for a husband, but instead she's just looking for a way to make the chuds mad or, or to kind of demonstrate how she she's on top of the feminist game. Because that's the only game that she was ever taught to play. And it's it's a completely futile one. Well, it's part of the reason that I think that there's kind of this recurring failure state, I consider, of the conversation where it, and this was kind of endemic through the Trump era, where, where it goes back to class analysis, right? It's like, oh, the working, the multiracial working class. And, and to me, I think that you focusing on, on, on kind of like status and prestige is, that's much more important because this really is a, is a caste problem. And, and I think that there's a, a an uncomfortable discussion that uh, non uh, uh, that dissidents, and I mean that, you know, our, our, our friends and others need to have about, about status. Mm. And it's what's so frustrating to me about, about Dreher is because his book, Live Not By Lies, has a large section about how if you are to be a dissident, you have to reject status, right? You have to reject the approval of the regime. And that means being seen not only as this kind of like dangerous, romantic, revolutionary figure, but as embarrassing, right? As low status, as, you know, kind of someone to be shunned. And I think that you, I see this in kind of like the, the upper crust of red state areas, you know, they have this, this part of them that wants to be right wing, that wants to be conservative, but they, they place a priority first and foremost above that on being prestigious. And they're willing to make that sacrifice to essentially stay polite, to stay good. And this is very much what I think you see in, in the David French types. You can see this in Rod Dreher's obsession with the European vacation, which is something that, you know, early in my life, I had a good European vacation when I was in college. And then since then, every time I've gone back, I've been just, I, I've only been back like once or twice, but it's a bit, this is a sort of cancer, I believe, on the American imagination. And this idea that like you experience culture with these little kind of, uh, you know, dipping your toes into all of these experiences, like drinking fine wine and sitting at a cafe or eating oysters. Or, or listening to choice classical music and having the right opinions about what kind of wine to get. Uh, this is just so fake. <laughs> I, I, you know, you, I, I don't know if this is a thing where you come from, but this this kind of pretentiousness about uh, fine wines and music and, and classical culture, I've just grown to just absolutely despise it, especially from people who can't, who, you know, they're they're consuming all of this classic culture and then they just despise history. I think history is a long line of slaveholders. And, well, and it's the and, problem of of loving the prestige of old world European culture, right? But only for 
like the prestige it brings. It, it's weirdly the same problem you see in an anime, right? Yeah. Which is, oh, I like the trappings of, you know, a steampunk Edwardian future, but I hate all of the things that actually produced that. You know, yeah. I essentially <laughs> want to go back to a, a steampunk era of, you know, you know, harem degeneracy and 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 blue haired, you know, man children. You know, this is you're you're hitting me in all the kind of spots that kind of trigger my own past uh but you know uh this has been you know, i was an anime person in high school and i i tell this to friends uh, the you know the 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 people in high school who were into like rap and football and marijuana ended up way more based 10 years down the line than all of the people who were dressing up in victorian outfits at the anime club who all invariably fell into progressive projects. There was even that one like super based article about the the woman the the woman rescuing her daughter from a, a group of you know tra trans influencers or trans trenders that she met at Sac Anime, which was like an anime convention right next to my hometown. I'm thinking I I know this scene. It, it, it's you know it's 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 this it's this idea that you can kind of like obtain the trappings of the old world and, and take it spiritually forward while you do nothing to actually preserve it. This is just disgusting. This is why I've kind of grown instantly. Uh, you know, I kind of have this, this kind of burn it to the ground mentality for all of these ancient trappings, like all the, this classic stuff. I, mean, I love classical works and, and I, I, I love ancient literature and, and I really value it. But I don't, I, I only want it to be something that people take seriously. The more it becomes like a trapping or an affectation, uh, the more I kind of despise it and want to see it burnt. If you're, if you're going to line your study with, with these leather bound books uh, written in Greek or, or the, the, or have all these copies of Dante's the divine comedy and Pilgrim's progress. And, you know, and, and then you're going to talk to me about the inherent whiteness of, of, of all, all of, of Christian morality or whatnot. I mean, I, this is just disgusting to me. And I mean, it was a little bit disgusting in the nineties where these kind of pretentiously antinomian attitudes were one posture among many in the intellectual class and you could say they're intellectuals first, and then they have these like weird, crazy racial opinions second. But now this class has been dominated by its racial opinions to the point where it's hard to see these kind of affectations of old European culture as anything other than, you know, as R.N. McIntyre says, you know, wearing the skin of the old world as a suit and walking around in it. And it feels just as gross. Well, to me, it... it... And, and maybe this is putting too fine a point on it, but it, the, there's the kind of the, the line oft repeated by the IDW types, like, oh, we're in a, in a, in a crisis of meaning, which, which is true, right? But to me, I, I also see, especially among, you know, people, you know, our age, right? Like millennials to Zoomers, mm -hmm. which is a, a crisis of sincerity, right? That there's this kind of like caustic layer of irony that permeates everything. You know, it's like, well, why do you like something? Well, do you like it because you actually like it or do you like it because it's part of kind of like a personal curated brand identity? You know, like you ought to be the type of person who, you know, posts the black square or you ought to be the type of person who reads, you know, classical literature. And, and you see this in kind of the, the true, like extremely online Zoomer behavior of like creating these new, like kind of halfway joking, halfway serious ideologies. Right, like, do you do you remember yeah. Neo Gastonianism? Whenever that came around, I I don't. Is that the one that's like you should be like Gaston from? Yeah, yeah, literally, it is the yeah. ideology of Gaston, right? Which of course is this like weird Zoomer joke, which is not it's it's harmless, right? Really, but at the same time, <laughs> there is this kind of like triple layer of irony that you see, you know, in our circles, but especially in kind of like the dirtbag left you know, kind of like Chapo Trap House all the way to yeah. like Red Scare Sphere where it's like, is anything being said actually being said? You know, or is it just something that we kind of, you know, hold on to as a, you know, like a prop almost? I, I mean, I will, I would defend doing something because you, you think you, you should like it. 
I, I, I'll defend that. I am um, recently on a basket weaving, uh, on a basket weaving expedition. This is like a get together in real life within this community. We went to see Handel's Messiah. And um, this is something that my parents dragged me to when I was a kid, it, uh, most Christmases. And then I kind of continued the tradition because I felt like I should. But then, you know, a year or two ago, and certainly this last time, I found myself just genuinely, incredibly enjoying it. And and then wanting to listen to it again after I got back from the the the, the concert hall or the the cathedral. And and so this this idea that you should like something making it inauthentic is I think that's misguided, but I think that the the real poison comes from when the presentation of the consumption is what you're getting off on. And that's why I think like the, the profilicity is what makes it kind of so poisonous. I mean, it's all right if you think you always should have read Moby Dick and, and you can never get past 100 pages in it. You know, talking about those 100 pages like you've read the entire thing. I think people have always done that, right? And, and, and the aspiration is, is important even if your time and your you know your inclination can't kind of build up to that height of actually doing it but i think it's when those sort of pretensions become an identity where it becomes sort of supremely fake and and creates the crisis that we're experiencing now because the alternative you know the alternative solution that the millennials came up with was well we're just going to retreat into whatever feels good and into nostalgia and into sort of mindless revolutionary politics with with no kind of aspirational sense whatsoever because the aspirational stuff is all fake i think that you 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 refined my point well because i do think that training yourself to have taste is an important process right because if you only go with kind of the the things that activate you know your amygdala you know your your lizard brain right that that obviously leaves you in a pretty pitiable state and so I do think that that's an important distinction to draw between kind of forcing yourself to kind of like eat your cultural vegetables, so to speak, mm-hmm. you know, to, to really torture an analogy here. Or no, man, I versus, think that's, that's true. You need to, right? Uh, right. Versus that kind of like, again, you know, kind of like curating an identity, you know, where you are, you know, making your consumption kind of a, a, I guess a, a, a shorthand for you know, kind of like a, a, what would have been a deeper cultural identity in an earlier era. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so hard because, you know, we would have never have been given this option in the past. Right. Uh, you, you know, it when you see it, you know, when people have deeply internalized things. Uh, no, but- definitely. And it's, it's something that I, again, have, and it's interesting you bring up Kashuda because this is something that I've, you know, kind of, she she gave me the words to describe this. Who is, is that the, again? Alex Kashuda. Oh, Kashuda. Yes, the, yes. We really are kind of we're kind of seeing the 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 I, the liberal idea that given ultimate choice, you know, man will become this kind of like you know ascended you know modern day aristocrat. We we've seen that proved false. Yeah. You know, and what we've Absolutely. seen is that given choice, you know, the vast majority of people they want to live in the pod. You know, they want to eat the bug. They want, they to, want to essentially have the just, box, yeah. right, exactly. And, and so many things that we're struggling with now, like identity, like feeling real, like not LARPing your way through life. The reason we feel like that is because essentially these are not choices we should be making, you know, before. Yeah, right? I mean, like, I was going to give you an example, like Bo- we, you and I both, I mean, you kind of reintroduced me to this character. I forgot he existed, but Bob Chipman, right? I bet if you ask Bob Chipman why he posts this and the stuff that basically confirms him is the, the right stereotype of a bug man two times every day. But I bet if you drilled into his mind uh, and, and, and kind of steel manned his own soul, what he would be saying is, well, this is just my sincerity. This is, this is just me living sincerely. This is just me reporting my thoughts as they occur to me. And, and guess what? He's sitting in sort of like this dopamine hug box and, <laughs> the sincere emotions that come out of him are just why shouldn't everyone to generate a death in a dopamine hug box while they get increasingly angry at people who don't. And that, that's, that's, that's a sincere experience of an emotion. It's just a really, really squalid one. 
Right. Yeah. It, it, I understand that you're feeling that, but that doesn't mean it's a good thing to feel. Yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. Well, and it's part of the reason why I don't, as much as I decry kind of like the division in our spheres, I kind of understand it because mm -hmm. in many ways we're kind of a group of people who are all, you know, to one degree or another children of the ashes. You know, all of us are not connected to a, you know, a living, breathing, functional tradition or else to be honest, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. And so we're all trying to essentially recreate, you know, a functional society kind of through secondhand sources, you know, like what did other people say? What did other people, you know, write about, you know, what a functional society was? Because in many ways, the only thing that, you know, the only thing that ties us together is, is a kind of a common realization that whatever this is, it isn't really working, you know, and all of these yeah. things that were never choices are now choices. And so we're kind of forced to, everyone is kind of making their best guess at what will, you know, fit in that, that box. Now, now you have the choice never to leave your house. Now after COVID, like tons of people, there's going to be a whole class of people that's never leave their house basically ever again. And that, that's going to be their existence. I mean, I guess there are people like that who are addicted to drugs in the past or who had some kind of chronic illness. But now, now we're going to have functionally healthy people deciding to just lock themselves away in their houses forever. Well, right. And to me, so I have a, you know, I have a good friend, right, who used to, uh, up until very recently, and not that he quit the job, you know, just that legislation changed. And he did, you know, body pickup for a, a rural funeral home, which is a, a grim job, obviously. Mm. Yeah. Of and course, he's a really sounds... interesting guy to talk to because he's someone who is not necessarily, he's not dumb by any means, but he's not really an intellectual guy. You know, he works with his hands. He has a real job. He's not really on the internet. But he's someone who you can talk to about decline because he's been in small town rural America for a long time. And interestingly enough, the way that you find bodies changes dramatically depending on how healthy a, a society is doing, right? Like not to be too grim mm -hmm. about it, right? But, no, no. Yeah. You know, grandma's 97. She falls down in the shower and, you know, expires, right? It's awful. It's, you hate to see it happen, but that's kind of a normal death. You know, and there's always car accidents. There's always things like that, which again, you you hate to see, but it happens. But what he's described is that there are more and more and more deaths of despair, right? Which is that he finds these people oftentimes, again, not trying to be gruesome here, but oftentimes after having sat there for weeks on end, because these people essentially had no human contact at all. You know, they got food delivered to their door. You know, they got grocery pickup. And, and so... You know, when, when kind of they're, you know, they shuffle off this mortal coil, they just sit there and rot. And, and that tells you, you know, kind of a multitude of things that tells you that the kind of like the normal, healthy social fabric that let's be honest, hasn't been in great condition for a long time, but was a whole lot more functional within living memory. You know, that it's just, it's not going well. And to me, right. I don't want to just relate this to my personal experience, but being a younger guy and you know, going through college kind of at the pre post 2020 split, I personally have seen this accelerate rapidly, you know, yeah, majorly. And it was really weird going to college, right? Because I, and I'll be the first to admit I had a, a non-traditional path through education. I ended up dropping out, you know, coming back to school. So some of that's my fault, but the difference in what college was pre and post COVID is almost a completely different ballgame. Like the entire social institution was essentially gutted and it came back, but it never really came back. You know, the vast majority yeah. of these people had spent just years and years all by themselves on the internet. And some people came back, but a lot of people, even, you know, young people uh, trapped in a box with a bunch of other young people who you'd assume would be hyper social. I couldn't make it back from that. And, and so I'm curious to see kind of how that trend will continue. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could be more hopeful. I, I, I honestly don't know. Obviously, COVID hit me when my first son was born, pretty much on the dot, and that's kind of naturally a time in people's lives where they kind of disappear from the world for a year or so. So I have to say, I probably got the least hard hit ever because you're taking off the social face of the earth right when you're expected to fall off the social face of the earth um 
but it, it hits harder when you realize that the old world isn't coming back. And it's, it's, it's small things like dinner parties or parties generally, or, you know, the, the parishes are just emptied at this stage because, you know, no one kept them open. I mean, they were they weren't allowed to the top down, and and it's hard to know like what, what what kind of society exists after this point in in the in history. I, I guess I have some hope that the right wing will be able to sort of reclaim real life first, but but even with that, there is sort of a hard path back. Right, and I think that that's been kind of and. Again, I, I love, you know, I love rural Americans. I love red staters, but there's a lot of, I'd say there's a lot of cope. You know, there's a lot of just pure copium. And this idea that is kind of pretended, that the, the left likes to pretend that, that, that this is real and the right still kind of does pretend like it's real also is that, you know, there are these kind of, you know, upstanding, you know, yeoman farmers littering the ground in rural <laughs> yeah. America. Yeah. And look, like there are some of them. You know, I know a few of them. There, there's Wendell Berry, and right, there's uh, Wendell Berry. There is his friend, right? <laughs> yeah, there, exactly. And my point in that is not to, you know, disparage, you know, red state Americans, but it's to say that I, I think we need to take a long, hard look in the mirror and essentially say, like, well, how much of this decay, you know, how much of this denigration has affected us? Because I look around, right, and my church has come is come back pretty much. Almost all of the, every, almost everyone is back. That's lucky. Very few people have. I know, but I realize I'm lucky in that. And there's a lot of places that closed down and never opened again. And the Catholic Church has had a harder time than the Protestant ones because the Protestant ones have been more able to buck orders, whereas the bishop says no, and then it just shuts down entirely, right? And the bishop is a focal point where power can focus, right? But sorry, I'm interrupting. No, no, not at all. Because that was kind of a logical extension of that, which is just that like, Again, this idea that, you know, we can kind of, as, you know, rural Americans, as kind of red staters, that we can just win, you know, the urban rural war, you know, that we can win the culture war and that will set everything right. I just don't see that. And one of the things that I've appreciated about you and Anglo Ortho, who I really, I, I keep saying this, I need to have on. Yeah, because it would be I a good conversation. Right? Fully agree and fully disagree with him. <laughs> But nonetheless, right? Well, that's that's the best conversations are based on that, right? It's harder to have a conversation with somebody. I mean, this, <laughs> this is an easy conversation, but a lot of times you agree with someone on every, everything, and the conversation doesn't go anywhere, right? Yeah, it's just a it's just a statement of of points. Yeah, but you have this problem, and and you know, you and and Anglo Ortho both bring this up that in fighting the culture war, in fighting you know the the war between the sexes you're kind of and in fighting the urban rural war you're kind of providing the system exactly what it wants you know you're kind of leading in leaning into their framing yeah and i think honestly that if there is a solution it will not be a victory in either of those conflicts it will essentially have to be a non-political or solution to that well and yeah that yes yes and no i mean i'm not kind of copy something from Charles Haywood here too. I mean, like the left needs to die. I mean, just, die. I mean, th there needs to be a rural and an urban synthesis, but the left, as we know today has so many bad ideas in it and so many anti-human ideas. I just can't see how even half of those ideas can, can functionally, I mean, maybe they can nominally, you know, uh, piggyback on top of some kind of synthesis, right? Some kind of Hegelian synthesis, but they can't, functionally piggyback off of it because it'll destroy any political body that they're attached to. And, and so uh, I think what we're seeking is some way that urbanites can, I, I don't know, I, I guess it's, it's hard to say, right? Because uh, the, the urbanite sort of Brahmin populations need to become aristocrats of the land, but they're nowhere near the land. And the 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 rural people need to know how to become yeomen and, and subjects again, but they they've been taught you know, the, for the entire last sixty years that they shouldn't bend a knee to anything or any higher principle, 
and, and that the model they should take for political power is essentially to to, to model their own struggles around the client classes uh, of our perverted uh, leadership. Well, it, there's a there's a distinction there that that's valuable, which is that I agree that the you know the left needs to die. It essentially is a a force of entropy, and, and preserving that force of entropy at best is only you know kind of like setting the boulder a little bit further up the hill, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I think that there is nothing inherently entropic about living in a city. There's nothing inherently entropic about being female, right? But these these categories have been <laughs> well, fully... well, not not if you read Maps of Meaning, meaning but <laughs> Jordan Peterson might have been unofficially based in his uh, his uh, assertion that that the, the female form has some intimate connection to chaos that we but but, but go on please yeah. But my point is that by seeding these categories to our enemies, by seeding the cities, by seeding by essentially saying yes, cities are left wing. By yes, women. By yes, you know any number of protected categories. Those are yours, and we're going to destroy them. You kind of lost the game before you started it. That that was my my point. Yeah, it, it's always hard though, right? Because I I don't know how you as a rural person influence the cities. It's a very difficult operation to do in reverse. I guess if you know if you have sort of a, a culture that's sort of independent from the cities, it can kind of attract a, a, an elite to it that, that might be able to take control of the cities uh, eventually. But it's hard because you know this is the 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 contradiction that a lot of the old conservatives fell into. We'd have people like William F. Buckley and all this, these people talking about classical music all the time, and these symphonies would be in these blue areas, and all of the musicians and the conductor would all be uh, huge progressives, right? And uh, so you'd, you'd have this sort of divide where the the conservative movement would be, uh, it couldn't really, it, it could be patrons uh, of this high culture, but it couldn't really dictate what it did. And I think that something's going to change there, right? The, 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 head, the problem is, is that the thing that most needs the baseness of the rural areas is sort of the very elements of the cast body that, that aren't located there. Right. And, and hmm, it, it is a complicated issue. And it's not one that I necessarily have an answer to because the problem is that, you know, this, this, you know, aspiring, you know, upper middle class, right. That you would, you would think would be, you know, kind of poised to take the reins from the current elite are almost to a man so fully enthralled to, you know, kind of like the ideology of the elite, you know, so firmly connected to that status game of, you know, being more and more progressive that I don't see how you break that cycle, to be honest. And, and it goes back to kind of one of my continual frustrations with, you know, Republicans, which is that they, they kind of have they have one tool, they have one lever they could pull, right? Which is essentially simultaneously screwing over the university system and paying off essentially, you know, the middle and upper middle class, which is by nationalizing, uh, yeah. you know, by nationalizing the endowments of universities to pay off student debt. But yeah. instead of doing that, which let's be honest, is, is a big if that would be complicated, that would be hard to do. They are fighting to the death to ensure that these universities get all of the money from the middle class, right? Uh, yeah. Which is essentially a situation where, you know, the left, the ruling class in America have set up a rake, you know, elaborately prepared it and basically said, hey, come over and step on it. And the Republicans have said, well, damn right, both feet and just jump on it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I just like, I, these people are are hopeless. You know, I just don't know that there, that there can be any kind of like, like, you know, iterative force coming from these people. They're, they're dead ends. It, it, it's, it's tragic because um, I guess the university, I don't exactly know how the universities are going to fail if they keep on getting bailed out. But I mean, everyone knows that these are a money sink and, and nobody's getting, making good on these things. So I, I don't know what to say. This is, it, it, it's just like, it's like we're just building up Deadwood and we're, we're waiting for something to come around and burn it all up because these university systems are allowed to keep on going. 
they're going to fuel the progressive fire for a lot longer because really at this stage, it's mostly women who are, who are the, the foot soldiers of this perspective. I mean, people have been commenting that it, the democratic party is going to be the party of hysterical white women. And, and that might be enough to give them the next 20 years of politics in the West. Right. And I mean, as anyone who's been in, been in a, an academic setting i mean you know these people you know you no, know these I, essentially like fem cell soldiers of the regime oh my and, yeah and some of them are married some of them are most of them are not and their their life is organized around this ideology and it's given them everything in a lot of ways right and i think that that's the that's the again goes back to kind of like the central question which is that how long can the game keep going you know ideally what you Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, no, carry on. Uh, ideally, what you do is you'd find some way to like it, it, get these women on your side because there's nothing like inherently about them. Well, I guess there are some things inherently about them that keeps them on the left. But you know, I, I, I guess you, you really can't, right? The whole – any kind of restoration needs to get these people out of administrative power because they're the source of most of the mistakes that we're making. And they're, they're what prevents reform from happening again and again and again. And, and so, but what, what do they do? What, 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 what's, what project do they work on if they're not wielding levers of power in these institutions? It's really hard to say. They, they don't have any ideas. A lot of them don't have any family lives. Well, and that's the thing that, that Spandrels pointed out that's so you know, devish, devilishly smart about this, is that the very fact that there's literally no other place for them to go is simultaneously what makes them fight so hard to stay there, right? Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, at kind of like a deep level, I, I think these people know that. You know, I think that they know, you know, that it, if things were different, they would, you know, be radically lower in status, that they wouldn't have, you know, this ability to kind of punish their enemies, you know, but they do, and they're going to fight like hell to keep it. And interestingly enough, because I kind of came of age politically during the Obama era, right? So I, I remember, you know, the the initial election, and I remember the huge kind of, I don't know how would you describe it, but the the enthusiasm, <laughs> yeah, the lack, well, the, the, the kind of like the enthusiasm, and then the, you know, the deafening silence afterwards, you know, when when the great, you know, when the great hope of of, of liberalism had arrived, and well, nothing had changed. But I remember that souring, you know, that, that feeling of, you know, kind of like the liberal, the, the, and I, I'm, I'm using liberal in a messy context here, but the, the progressives in America kind of getting a taste for blood to a certain degree. And, and the trade seemed to have been made where it was like, all right, well, we won't give you, you know, luxury gay space communism. You know, we won't fix it, but we will give you a stick to go after your enemies with. And that's something that is kind of frightening. Well, that, that's the game that they want to play. I mean, have you seen people are going to criticize me for mentioning this person the same way they criticize you for mentioning Dreher, but like the whole Vosh phenomenon is a great example of that. Like, the guy is basically a new liberal at this stage. He, he's basically just, let's punish the righties. The State Department's always right. Our, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm an anarchist, but there, there's nobody that we should trust more than the FBI. Well, and you've seen this in the, and this is a, this will make no sense to anyone listening to this in even a week's time, right? But this is, this is kind of the core of the, of the dialogue around banning gas stoves, yeah. you know, that it, that it's something that, I, cause I mean, look like you're, you're from progressive areas. Mm. I, I know these people, gas stoves were a trendy high status thing to have. They, they were until, and literally in a week Berkeley. ago. In Berkeley in 2003 to 2013, everyone wouldn't shut up about their gas stoves and how much better it was than conduction. And they would go into the physics of it and they'd explain it and they'd demonstrate it to you. And you could feel, I mean, it's, it's true of all the bullshit progressives were spewing between 2003 and 2013. That was the one thing they had right was that open flames gives you more control over the heat than conduction. And now today, everybody, are, are, are a lot of these people, they just flip on a dime. And now they're talking about how this was all an illusion and conduction is better. <laughs> and it's it's a wonder to behold. It, it really is. Right. And, and again, there's nothing like, 
there's nothing real to it in the sense that uh, the vast majority of people chiming in on this issue have literally no, it's not relevant to them. You know, yeah. in the vast majority of states, it's a minority of, of homes have gas stoves. You know, it's like anywhere from 10 to 30%, especially in older homes. But yeah, it's not important. But it's a way to punish the chuds. You know, yeah. and, and the, the real question is essentially how much of society <laughs> will be burned as long as it hurts the chuds more than it hurts everyone else. <laughs> They're going to create a new department of punishing the chuds and, and play all angry women in that. Those be un unleashed on their political opponents coming up with weird regulations that they all kind of collectively <laughs> occur to them. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you you know that there would be a market for this stuff if they could find some way to justify it. I mean, climate change, that can be used to justify anything, right? Well, I mean, if, if testicles emitted carbon, like they would all have us castrated because that's what they would want. That would be their their absolute fantasy. Well, and that's that's especially interesting because, and, and again, the boomer conservatives, when I say that they have the right instincts, you know, they're, they're kind of on a gut level suspicious of things like climate change, right? They know it's not right, but the solutions that they're handed to as to, well, about climate change are essentially like low IQ drivel, right? Yeah. It, it's, oh, climate change is a, is a plot to, you know, pay people money to make more studies. And okay, I mean that that that's a, a almost direct quote from a conversation. And like, okay, kind of part of that is maybe right. Like, there's a page. There, I mean, there there's a core truth to that. I mean, that's how this thing started, right? Right. This thing but, started because there is this there is this uh, feedback loop between grants and grant writers that creates an incentive to exaggerate the dangers of catastrophes that occur like thirty or forty years in the future. Well, well, right. But then there's a there's a broader there's a broader point, which is that this is the ideal crisis, right? It is yeah. a massive crisis somewhere in the future that can never really be, you know, specified. Yeah, and, and I, I, everything causes anything. it, and everything is caused by like it causes everything, and everything is caused by it, right? Or sorry, everything causes climate change, and climate change causes everything. And, and nothing you can never tell exactly how much something or something does not contribute to climate change, but we have to get yeah. rid of it. You know, yeah, and exactly. it's kind of like the ultimate, you know, state of exception. It's essentially, you know, like the, the managerial state's, you know, ultimate dream. And no, but no one's going to ever ask about the, whether your transition surgery was carbon neutral. <laughs> right, right, right. But they Again, certainly or, are going to ask if your kid's carbon neutral. Or, and, the, or the massive, you know, wealth transfer to Ukraine. Of course, I'm sure, I'm sure exactly. that was done with the renewal. war in Ukraine is, is that carbon neutral? Is that a green war? I don't know. Well, well. Anyway, Dave, we're we're over time, and, and I okay. appreciate it so much for you coming no out. So, if people want to, you know, hear more of your work, where can they find you? Uh, well, I, I'm an old fogey in this sphere. I, I do YouTube videos on the channel The Distributist. I do a weekly live stream, which are way too long, and I attempt to get video essays out when I can. I'm trying to re-examine where I want to put my time this year, but uh, I also have a Substack, which is called Fiddler's Green, which is linked in almost every recent video so thanks for having me on are there any super chats yeah there, there's one super chat from blero 393 for five dollars uh here's to another mention of david french and uh misspelling rod dreyer uh january 13th <laughs> is, is another it's something rude that i can't read and i like my youtube channel so i'm not going to read that out uh january 13th is another day to begin to keep our new year's resolutions <laughs> I think it's poking fun at me for not being able to keep my New Year's resolution. Uh, great discussion. Well, thank you so much, Bolero, for the for the money. I I, I appreciate it, and I, I hate to say it, I might just have to ab abandon this New Year's resolution because I, well, I I've broken it so many times. At this don't point. worry. I, I think Nick Land said today that Dreyer has the devil's luck and that he's always able to somehow st keep talking about things that are relevant in a cringe way. But but I really do think that Dreher's time in the spotlight's really numbered. I think everyone knows that this is kind of over at this stage. This well, last right. year kind of just the, the illusion of what he is and what he represented has kind of been dispelled in a lot of important ways. Exactly, right? Like the, the internal contradictions of, of Dreher are just like so apparent at this point that even at a lol cow, as as a lol cow, he's kind of lost his I don't know. He kind of has lost his potency because it's kind of like 
it's like the Christian effect where it's like, this is yeah. just so bad that it ceases to impact me anymore. You know, like I've already seen you do something so embarrassing that it's no longer shocking, you know, it's yeah. just kind of continually embarrassing. Yeah. Once you know, once you get the idea of Chris Chan, you don't need to keep up on every, I mean, unless you're somebody who just gets off on the pure comedy of it, you don't need to keep up with the Chris Chan story. There was this amazing article written by Morgoth a few weeks ago. Uh, well, there's, there's a way of multiple ones, but because he's one of the most brilliant writers in our sphere. But the, the one that kind of stuck with me was the, the, the year the internet stopped laughing. And I was recently talking to Black Horse, and he said, it's really going to take the internet to stop laughing for us to, for things to actually start happening. Because politics isn't funny. And if it's just about finding somebody who's cringe online so you can convince yourself that your enemies are like that, and they might be like that, then you know that's going to be your little hug box. That's going to be your little. That's going to be your reason for getting online. But the only way we can move forward is to talk about new ideas and 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 actually ways to react to this. And once people stop laughing, they're going to want to actually find a way to to live their principles in real life. And I think that as much as possible, I want to try to give them tools to help them do that. I think you might have another super chat there, though. Oh yeah, you know, and and we'll we'll get to that because I, I want to I want to bring something up that I think that, and this is kind of a, a call to the audience that I think that you should look at that, look at who wants to kind of keep laughing when the joke isn't funny anymore. You know, the the people who want to kind of go back to you know the 2016 era of the internet where it's all just fun and games, because like that was okay for a little bit, right? There was a time and place for that, but now, like you've said, like the internet has stopped laughing. You know, it's not funny anymore. Things have mm. started to get worse. You know, and this isn't just like, oh, it's some, you know, blue hair we found online. And you know what? I think that you should look at who's taking things seriously and look at who is, you know, trying to keep the joke going and take note of that. And I'm not going to name names. I'm not going to like turn this into drama, but <laughs> I would certainly name names if this was my channel, but it, it, all right, fair enough. <laughs> look at what I, happened. I, I, I see Kanye all those situation. centrists out there. You, you know what direction I'm looking at. Yes. <laughs> but also I think you, you saw it in our circles with the Kanye situation because yeah. anyone who was serious, anyone who was really here for solutions saw through that instantly, saw yeah, exactly exactly. what that was going to turn into. Yeah. And fair enough. Maybe there were some people who, who were really bought it you know, and really, you know, went out on a limb, swung and missed. And okay, fair enough. Maybe I have some sympathy for that. But I don't think you should be following. I don't think you should be considering someone's opinion if they thought that was a good idea. Because again, like what we're seeing is that like this has started to get, it started, it stopped being fun. You know, and I don't mean to say that I hate this conversation or I don't like hanging out with you guys because that's not what I mean. But you know, internet politics as just kind of like an extension of, you know, kind of like teenage 4chan culture is, you know, is over. And I, I think that, you know, that that's 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 something that needs to be kind of explored in, in 2023. Yeah, I agree. All right. Rotten meat for five dollars. You got Dave incensed. Always a joy. Really want to hear him go fire and brimstone one of these days. <laughs> uh, I didn't know it was so imperturbable. I thought I got incensed all the time. All right, uh, Lou Templar for ten dollars. Thank you very much. I felt for a while that to ascend, we must kill the meme culture. There must be no other way to get serious than to remove our inner Joker and become. You get the idea. I'll, I'll, I'll say a, a, a qualified uh, agreement to that. I, I do think that it's fun to joke around. You know, it's fun to have this kind of like gallows humor. But if if that's kind of like the be all end all of it, you know, if if your only point is to, you know, just make a joke. You know, if that's the, the the end point of it, then, you know, you don't belong here, right? And again, I say that as someone who's been, you know, beaver posting and posting stupid, you know, emojis in every chat that went live today. Again, it's a joke. Yeah. So I'm not saying that. But the idea that by, you know, it's like step one, make funny memes. Step two, question mark. Step three, profit. Like that, that's obviously been completely and totally disproven. You know, the and, memes for memes sake, the self-referential memes are the ones that are kind of particularly poisonous, but the, 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 there have been memes that have just communicated eternal truths. I think of like, 
uh, the high IQ, low IQ, middle IQ bell curve meme or the yes meme. I mean, that's just atomic human culture at a very, very quick level, uh, reminding us of things that were always true. And I think that will never die. There would be right, graffiti right. of that if, you know, in, in ancient Rome, if there wasn't it on, on the digital interwebs. Well, right. And the example I always think of is, is and this is kind of a, again, a, a meme, but you know, that made it into the real world is, is stop tomboy genocide, right? Yeah. Which is a stupid thing. It's kind of silly. You know, and it uses the language of Wojax, but it, it brings up a, a serious topic. And I'm not one to say that, look, all art must be political. I think that we need to be making art to begin with, you know, we're not, yeah. and some of us are doing it, you know, but nonetheless, like this idea that I guess like the, the end all be all is this kind of like teenage, you know, watch it all burn, you know, Joker status, I, I think is coming to its end. And I probably, you know, said all I have to say on that. All right. Uh, 99 Iron Duke for $5 Australian. Uh, Jay Burden and Dave, the distributist, are two of the best people in our sphere. Well, thank you very much, Iron Duke. Uh, Iron Duke, uh, Lady of Shalott, uh, Furious Pertinax, and Chris Gard, all the Aussies, were over on uh, Semiagog's stream. For oh, yeah. Party. So you guys should check that out because I, you know, I have a great deal of affection, you know, for Aussies, you know, both those guys in particular. You know, also, you know, people I know IRL. And uh, so you guys should check that out because there's a lot of weird stuff going on in Australia. You know, they're kind of the the test bed of, of the GAE in many ways. And so if you're kind of looking at what's coming down the pipe, uh, Australia might be a, a good place to look for that. Man, those former former British colonies just have it rough. I know. Tell me about it. I, I've kind of joked with, uh, you know, with, with the Canadians and the Australians and the English. I, I, every time I have one of those, you know, one of those nationalities on. I basically ask them, well, who's the most screwed, you know, out of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> and and generally it's about 60% say it, it's the guys in the UK. Like they're, they're the most doomed, but it's them in yeah. Canada are kind of 50, 50, you know, tied for, <laughs> but nonetheless, I completely agree with you, you know, that those guys have it rough, but I think that, you know, kind of brings this, the stream to its close again, you know, Dave, thank you so much for coming out. Obviously you're a huge influence of mine and, and I enjoy talking wow. to you. Well, thank you. I mean, you're, you have a great interview show. I'm amazed how much content you can put out more than I can listen to certainly. And your, your, your podcast gets priority in my queue. So that that's saying a lot. So, Well, well thank you. The, the secret is to be uh, underemployed and 23 years old when you can get an astonishing amount <laughs> oh, done man. when you have yeah. nothing else to do. Oh, wow. Yeah. But it, um, just, uh, just keep some of that energy for when you, when you have kids, cause you're going to need to spend a lot of it running after them. So <laughs> well, I'll keep that in mind. All right. So anyway, all guys, right. Uh, Dave already gave you his links, my stuff. You can find me obviously on YouTube, uh, but also on Apple, Spotify, you know, anywhere you listen to audio only shows you, you can probably see, you know, for those watching, you know, the video show that we've redone the look of the show that will continue marching out. I, I really want to put more effort into this because I like this. It's fun. And I want to show you guys that, you know, I'm taking this seriously. And uh, if you want to support the show, you can, you know, you can follow me on Subscribestar, on Patreon, you know, anywhere you want to give me money, I'll take it. Again, I don't expect it, but it helps cover the cost of the show. And uh, remember, guys, keep your head up. The lie can't last forever. Good night. <laughs>